Right, good morning, everyone. Today, we're going to continue on the actuators topic. We started in the last lecture. In the last lecture, we saw how to define the electro, how to model the electromechanical energy conversion from electrical through a magnetic towards a mechanical uh, energy, which is the principle of operation of most of the actuators they are going to see in this course. We, we stop at the definition of the energy in the uh, magnetic field. And we saw that the derivative of that energy with respect to a uh, moving variable, a variable that represents the moving part in the mechanical system is what gives the force. And I did some exercises there where the relation between the current and the magnetic flux linkage was provided. And you saw that by taking that integral and taking the subsequent derivative with respect to the moving part would give us the force. Today, we are going to go uh, one step further and try to find that relation between the magnetic flux linkage and the current itself and see if we can expand the analysis a little bit to get now to a simpler version of the me me mechanical force developed in such systems. So this will be the last lecture before our midterm, which will be after the reading week on uh, the 22nd, I believe, the Monday after the reading week. So the midterm will go from lecture one to lecture 10 all included. Okay, so in this lecture we're going to establish the relation between the force and the um, and the, the current applied in, in one of those actuators that we've, we've been studying. Calculate the force developed in the electromagnet and understand the principles, uh, the principle of operation of linear and uh, rotary actuators. Here is one simple example. This is an electromagnet that is typically used in the industry to lift heavy loads. The question that we can ask today is what is the maximum weight it can lift given the known electromechanical characteristics of that actuator? Here's another example that you've probably encountered before. This is a magnetic locking system for a door. We know that there is uh, always a very high resistive force to open the door until you unlock it. How does that work? What is the maximum force required to unlock the door? How does that work exactly? There's probably a magnet creating a magnetic field that keeps the door locked. And when we activate it, we are actually sending a magnetic field in the opposite direction as that of the permanent magnet to cancel it out so the door can be unlocked. And when the power goes off, then the magnet goes, um, the magnet, the permanent magnet, again, provides a force that keeps the door locked. This way, we can maintain the door locked without any external power, and power is only used to unlock it. All right, so it's like having a magnetic field that is shifted, that has an offset, and that offset is given by a permanent magnet. When you add a coil, the coil can now increase that offset, but it can also decrease the offset, bring that back to zero, and then the door can be unlocked. It works on the same principles of electromechanical energy conversion that you have been studying. Here's another application you're going to see in the upcoming lectures. This is a stepper motor. Instead of a force developed in a linear actuator, in a rotary actuator, we'll be, we'll be talking about the torque developed in that actuator. So if you want to model this uh, stepper motor, how can we calculate the torque developed in the motor itself? It's again, the same principle of operation, but instead of a linear motion, we have a rotary motion. And this will be the focus of one of our upcoming lectures as well. Okay, so the theory in this lecture is not very heavy. It's the continuation of what we saw in the previous lecture. So let's get it started by going back to the actuator we defined before. We had an actuator consisting of a magnetic core an air gap and a moving plate. So there is an air gap between the moving plate and the core where a coil is attached. Now the coil is simply a wire around the magnetic core. And that wire uh, creates, now when apply a current, creates a voltage. Okay. Um, if we are interested now in modeling the system, we can consider this to be an ideal inductor. We can see this coil as an, an ideal inductor itself. And how can we now model this to the, develop the equations for analysis? 
we can start by looking at the flux linkage and now finding the relation between the flux linkage and the current in the actuator. The flux linkage, we define that in two ways. The first way to define that is the number of turns of a coil times the uh, magnetic flux itself. The second way is the inductance times the current. And this comes by equating two different equations. For some reason, I can't use my, my pencil today. So I'm going to use the light board for that. So the first way we can relate them is by simply realizing that the magnetic flux is given as the integral of the electromagnetic force, um, the electromagnetic, the EMF, the electromechanical force generated, sorry, is the integral of the EMF, the induced EMF as a plate moves over time. If you now take the derivative of this on both sides, we get the phi equals to E, and we can now over dt, of course. All right. And you can now equate this. So this is the EMF around the coil. And you know that the EMF around the coil is also given as L di dt. All right. Or d phi dt times the number of turns, which would allow us to write the other equation. We can now equate this part here. We have d phi equals to L di. When you now take the integral, uh, sorry, d lambda equals to L di, when you take the integral, we have L times. L. So now we have the relation here be between the magnetic flux linkage and the inductance of this specific solenoid, this actuator, that we are now representing as a ideal inductance. Right? So that's equation one, that's where it comes from. So we equate the EMF induced in the coil to the magnetic flux linkage to the derivative of the current times inductance, and that's how we get that equation. Now we can expand this a little bit more. If you take equation one, which is um, d phi, which is defined as lambda over i, we can now find the expression for lambda, the magnetic flux linkage, which is simply n times phi, the number of uh, lines of the magnetic flux, basically. And the magnetic flux is given as B times A. Here it is, uh, which can now be replaced. B can be replaced which, with mu A, mu H times A. All right. So this is nothing really new here. Now we can find an expression for the current. With the expression for the current, we can take that from the uh, Faraday's law that is stated at the integral of H D L equals to N I. This is unreadable. Integral of HDL equals to NI, which is what we have down here. I now isolate it for the current, replace the current in this expression, and so forth. And as we saw before, we'll de derive the expression for the inductance that it now depends on the number of turns of the coil squared divided by the reluctance of the magnetic path, the reluctance seen by the magnetic flux that loops around that core. Okay, this equation is not new, it was derived before in one of the early, earlier lectures. So let's look at equation three. We define inductance as the number of, as, pro, as being proportional to the square of number of turns, that makes perfect sense. The more turns we have, the more magnetic field, the more flux linkage we have in the, uh, in the core, divided by the reluctance. Of the, the or the uh, resistance to this to establishing a magnetic flux in the core. Does that make sense? Well, it makes perfect sense. The greater the reluctance, the harder it is to establish a magnetic flux. Hence, the inductance of the coil decreases. Right? The harder it is to establish a magnetic flux, so the easier it will be to oppose that magnetic flux with changes in the current. So the higher the inductance. So the smaller the inductance, now we tend to an environment where it is easy to establish a magnetic field. And if it is easy to establish a magnetic field, it is hard now to oppose that magnetic field by changing the current or uh, in the inductor. So equation three makes, makes perfect sense. Another thing to note here, which is very important, is that the inductance 
now depends on the gap between the plate and the core. If you change the gap, we change the inductance. Okay. And this is actually the principle of operation of some sensors. That you maybe see in sensors and instrumentation. What it could do in this case here to define the distance between X, uh, that distance X would be to apply, let's say, um, a AC voltage to the coil, a AC voltage to the coil and watch the phase shift between the current and the, the voltage. We watch the phase shift and that phase shift we know will depend on the resistance of the wire that it doesn't change, but it will also depend on the inductance and therefore will depend on the distance between the plate and the core. So if you watch the phase shift between this modulated AC signal and its current, the current it creates, we can infer what the distance is. So we can create um, a sensor, a position sensor that way, right? It's the principle of operation of some LVDT position sensors. All right. Now let's, now that we define the inductance and we know that the inductance depends on the core, the distance between the core and the plate, let's go back to the concept of energy and co-energy once again. We saw that uh, the energy and the co-energy are both defined as the integral of either the current times the, in, uh, over the flux linkage or the flux linkage over the current. And we also saw that for a linear system, these two formulations are exactly the same, are equivalent. The reason we have two formulations here is that sometimes, depending on how motion occurs of that plate, it is more convenient to use one over the other. Right? But if the system is linear, energy and co-energy, which are simply the areas under and above that curve, Will, to, uh, will simply be the same, all right? So we can define the energy as the integral of I d lambda, which means that this area here is the energy. And you can define the co-energy as the opposite, integral of lambda d i. So we have the other half of the curve, right? Or the other area of that, uh, under that curve, okay? If we take that electromagnet and we decrease the air gap. If you decrease the air gap, what happens to the energy? This is the magnetic energy. What happens to it? Does it increase or decrease? If we take the electromagnet and we move that the plate towards the core, what happens to the energy? Does it does it increase or does it decrease? I think uh, would it decrease because the air holds so much energy because it's not permeable? Exactly, exactly. It would decrease because now to magnetize the air, we would need a lot more energy than it takes to magnetize the core because the permeability of the air is much lower, right? So if we decrease the air gap, both energy and co-energy decrease. So this dashed arrow that we see in the, sec in the, in the middle graph there, denotes what happens if we decrease the air gap, okay? So that's the field energy and that's the field uh, co-energy that we defined before. Now let's go back again to this same principle that we studied in the last lecture. The, we have the plate and we want to move that plate. If the plate moves, there is a mechanical energy developed in the system and that energy will have to come from somewhere. Where it comes from? Well, it comes from the a stored magnetic energy or what we call the field energy. So if you move the plate, field energy is what providing is what is providing force, is will be then transferred into mechanical motion. There are two possible ways for this motion to occur, two possible assumptions that we are making. We are either keeping the current constant or the magnetic flux linkage uh, uh, constant. So in the first case, let's assume that the movement occurs quickly. If the movement occurs quickly, then the magnetic flux linkage will tend to stay constant and the current will change. Why does the current change if the motion occurs quickly? And when I say the current changes, the current only changes during motion. If I take the plate 
and let's say the system is stationary, we have a steady state current of one amp. When I move the plate, that current will decrease as I move the, the plate. And when I reach steady state to a new position, the current goes back to one amp. Why does that happen? It's a changing uh, rate of change of the magnetic flux. Precisely, the rate of change of the magnetic flux. And why does the magnetic flux change? Why does the magnetic flux change? Is it was the change in like the length of, in this case, the air gap? Exactly, the change in the air gap, or more precisely, the changing reluctance. You remember that the flux is defined as Ni over the reluctance, right? And the reluctance is now changing. The reluctance is equivalent to a resistance. As we move the plate, the reluctance will be changing. So the magnetic flux changes. And as the magnetic flux changes, d phi dt is not constant. That creates a back EMF. And that, and that back EMF now opposes the current coming from the power source. And during motion then, the uh, we'll see the current decreasing if we approach the core, the, the core and increasing if we go far, uh, if we move away from the core during motion only, okay? So any changes in the mechanical, uh, the mechanical system now will, will take some energy that is coming from the field energy. So we can now say the variations in the field energy equals variation in the mechanical energy that is equation six the variation in the mechanical force in, in, the, in, the, in the mechanical system is simply the force times the displacement and that equates to variations in the field energy. We now can take the partial derivative of the field energy with respect to that emotion X that we called X. And this now gives the force developed in the system. Uh, here, assuming that uh, the current changes and the magnetic flux linkage remains constant. All right, so the derivative of the field energy with respect to what is moving gives the force. In the second case, now motion occurs slowly. If motion occurs slowly, the assumption is that this slow motion will not create a significant change in the magnetic flux or the derivative of the magnetic flux is not sufficient to cause the current to, de to decrease. It is then assumed that the current remains constant and what is going to change, because something needs to change in this phi uh, lambda y graph for uh, energy to, to, to change. What is changing now is the magnetic flux linkage and the current remains constant. Okay. And we can now take the, the, the same approach. We now are going to use the co-energy for this calculation because it is more convenient when the magnetic flux linkage is held constant. And in this case here, it's the same. We equate variations in the mechanical to variations in the field energy. We take now the derivative of the field energy with respect to the displacement, and that is what gives the developed force. Okay. I have uh, a question. Uh, yes. Something that kind of confused me from the other lecture. I feel like you've said it a bunch of times, but it's just not gone through my head. Uh, it makes sense um, for the second one when it occurs, or actually, the, yeah, the second one, when it occurs slowly, that the uh, the flux... Actually, wait a second. So when it occurs quickly, like the, uh, the d lambda by dt is equal to n uh, d phi by dt, right? Yes. So if we're moving really quickly, wouldn't the flux be changing too? And that would mean that we have a change in the, the uh, like the magnetic flux would be changing. So we have a change in d lambda by dt, like the rate, of, uh, there would be a rateage. Yes, th th there would be, but in, in there, there would be either way, but the uh, these two assumptions are, as I said, are assumptions, right? In reality, both are changing. Both are changing, mathematically, both will be changing. But for the purpose of determining the energy and its on its derivative, we are assuming that only one changes at a time. Oh, okay, I'll, I'll write and, that down. It, then. It's again yeah. an assumption, uh, and in, in reality, are, they are both both changing. Okay. Well, yeah. As long as you move the plate, there is a changing magnetic field, 
right? And if there is a changing magnetic field, there is a back EMF. There is no way around, right? Mm -hmm. There is no threshold. Oh, this is too fast. It's not going to produce any back EMF. That doesn't happen. Yeah. Uh, but the assumption is that it's insignificant. In the same way that in the other case, it is assumed that uh, in this case, now the magnetic flux linkage will remain constant. Okay. But, All right. Thanks. Yeah. Perfect. So it would actually, this point would more likely travel like that. Right. Instead of up or uh, vertically or horizontally. All right. So now the uh, what we derived here was a simple equation that relates the the force in the magnetic field, and we stopped at the force being now the derivative of the field energy. We can now take this approach one step, one step further, and try to relate that because you know that what is changing is actually the inductance. We can try to relate this to the inductance, which in turn will be related to the reluctance of the core, and then finally that relation between uh, phi and i that we were looking for. Sorry, the relation between lambda and i. I keep saying phi lambda, the flux linkage and the current is, is given here in equation eight. So now you can take the approach one step further. So let's do that. The derivation is here, but for some reason, I my pencil is not connecting. So I'm gonna do this on the whiteboard today. Uh, but this is what you see in, in slide 10 and 11. So we stopped here. Now the relation between the flux linkage and the current through the inductance. And you can now take either the energy or the co-energy and calculate that as a function of this. It's the same way we did in the previous lectures. So this would be the integral from zero to lambda of i d phi, d, d lambda. Uh, lambda is given here. All right, so, sorry, uh, current is given here. So the current is simply lambda over L. All right, so the energy now becomes integral from zero to lambda over of oh, lambda over L, d lambda, and this gives lambda squared over 2L of X. And I'm saying here L of X, right? because L, the inductance, depends on the reluctance, which depends on the distance between the plate and the core. Okay, so this is now the energy. It's a lot more convenient now because instead of simply going with this formulation, we now relate this to the inductance. This is something we can calculate easily. Okay, what is uh, lambda here? We can take it from this, uh, this equation. So the energy is L squared I squared divided by two L of X, All right? And this gives the energy as one half of I squared times the inductance. This is the field energy in the core. Interesting, this is exactly the energy stored in the inductor. This is exactly the energy stored in the inductor. If you look at it, if you remember from physics one, all right, the, this is exactly the energy stored in the magnetic field in the inductor. It makes perfect sense because this is how we modeled our inductor. We assumed that an inductor was a, uh, the coil was a perfect inductor. Hence the start energy in the field is the energy stored in the inductor. What is the force? Well, the force is now the derivative of this with respect to the displacement. What it depends on the displacement? The current doesn't depend on the displacement. That's an assumption we can make, but it this depends on the displacement. So the force developed in the actuator now would be one half of I time is squared times the partial derivative of L of X divided by uh, with respect to the displacement X. All right, so this is now the second equation of motion, uh, an equation of motion, the equation of the relates force to motion. Okay. This doesn't really answer our question perfectly because we still have the inductance here. Now we need to determine the inductance. So what is the relation there? We'll take this one step ahead. And if you remember the inductance is 
the number of turns squared divided by the reluctance, the reluctance of the magnetic core. So back to this example here, what would be the reluctance of this system if we consider this, the, uh, only the air gap? Let's assume that the permeability of the core is infinite. So it requires zero EMF, MMF to, to develop magnetic flux. What is the reluctance of this core? What is the reluctance here? Seen by the impede, by, by the inductor. X over UA. Sorry, I couldn't hear you. X over UA. F X over mu times A, precisely. X, which is the total, the total uh, path. So that there would be two X, right? X on top and X at the bottom. Well, let's assume just for, to get like a generic expression, we can assume that this is X times x divided by mu a. Mu is the air gap, right? So mu zero times a, the cross-sectional cross -sectional area of the air gap. We can now replace this here. Right? And now our force becomes one half of i squared times the partial derivative of the inductance, which is n squared divided by the reluctance x over mu a. So this is with respect to x. All right, so the force here is one half of i squared n squared times mu times a one over X. Okay, what is the derivative of one over X with respect to X? Ln X. Hmm? Ln X. Natural log the, log the, log. the derivative, that's the integral. Oh. Yeah. The derivative is X negative one goes upstairs. All right, so minus X times x to the power of negative two. So negative one over s is squared. Yeah, negative one over s is squared, this. Okay, I'm going to neglect the sign because you're interested in the magnitude of the force anyways. So this, this gives now one half of mu a, and we have n i over x all squared. All right, again, derivative here is one over x squared. There it is. So I'm just putting n i in the square here. All right, that's the force. Now we see that the force here depends on number of turns, depend, depends on x. So this is getting closer to something uh, more useful, is squared. What can we conclude here, first of all? This is a squared. What does it mean? i is a squared. So the current is a squared. The sign of the current doesn't matter doesn't matter in which way the current is being applied. The force between the plate and the core is always towards the core. If you revert the current, it doesn't change anything. The force, the force is always going towards the core, always attracting the plate. The only way to get a force to move the plate away from the core would be to add a magnet somewhere, right? But without the magnet, you can only move the plate towards the core. And you can see that from the equation here. How do we find the current? How do you define the current? And uh, let's say that we, we want this as a function of the flux density. What is the relation there? How do we find the flux density as a function of I? Uh, we use our favorite equation, integral of H dl equals to Ni. H is B over mu, L is X equals to ni, so i equals to bx divided by mu n. 
right? And you can now replace I here. What do you get? We now have the force as one half of mu A times N times Bx over mu N times X. All right, so what, what happened here? All is squared. X cancels X. This cancels that. This mu cancels the squared here. So the force is one half of B squared A over mu. All right, that's the force. Okay, that's the force developed in the core. The force depends on B squared again, right? So if you change the current direction, the force doesn't change direction. And can we say that the force is independent of the air gap? Can you say that the force is independent of the air gap? Yes or no? No. No, why not? Because B still depends on the flux and the path and everything. Precisely, because B depends on the path, right? So if you change the, the direction, or if you change the distance between the plate and the core, the reluctance changes. As the reluctance changes, the magnetic flux changes, and that will change B, right? So the equation that is given here doesn't show that, but indirectly it will depend. Also, if you remember from the past lecture, we defined the energy as, what was that, B squared, over two mu times the volume, times the volume. So if you look at these two equations, we can say that the force is the energy divided by X, right? Because this is the area, this is the volume. The area is the cross-sectional area of the air gap. When you multiply by X, we get the volume, here it is, right? So if you now take the energy divided by X, that also gives the force. Okay, any questions about this derivation? So I did hear this with the energy, you can do with the co-energy, you should find the same, the same thing. Are there any questions here? So this is slides, these are slides 10 and 11, all this derivation is there, but I just wanted to walk you through the derivation here. And the derivation that we did was for a system like this, right? Like this one, where uh, we are only considering one air uh, gap, the distance is X there. Okay, if we go with a system like that, then it's to be aware that here we have, this is the area, right? That's the area, but if we now have a system like the other one on the, uh, what is this, the right? We have two areas. We have two areas to consider. The effective area between the plate and the core, right? So in the first case, it would be area A. In the second case, the area would be 2A, right? However, for this equation here, don't get this one mixed up. In the first one, it would be X. In the second one, it would also be X, not 2X. Right, 2x would be used to calculate the core flux and the uh, the magnetic field and, and so on. That would depend on both axes going up and going down. But for this equation, we are only considering now the attraction between them, the closest distance between these two plates. Okay, any, any questions about this derivation here? Any, does this make some sense? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a very interesting derivation for a variety, variety of reasons. We can make sense of these equations. We can see the inductance depending on the inver the inversely proportional to the reluctance, and this makes perfect sense, right? The higher the reluctance, the harder it is to establish a magnetic field, uh, the, the easier it is to oppose that magnetic field. If the, inductance, the reluctance is very high, then it is easy to establish a magnetic field and it's harder to oppose that magnetic field. 
what else can you see from this interesting set of equations? We can also see here, where did they go? We can see here that the force only depends on the derivative of the inductance. So in a stepper motor, for example, depending on where the position of the rotor is, the inductance will change. And that's what determines the force or the torque. What else can we conclude from this? Another very important in information here is that if the inductance of our system is constant with respect to the moving part, there is no force developed. If the inductance is constant with respect to the moving part, there is no force developed in the system. That is to say that if we go back here, if we go back to this example and we make the air gap and the magnetic core having the same permeability, the inductance no longer depends on X and there is no, more, no force developed in the system. Right? If there is no force developed in the system if the permeability is the same throughout. All right, so this is another indication here that if we want to build a motor that creates uh, a lot of force or uh, a torque, or we want to create a uh, solenoid that develops a lot of force, we need to maximize the way the inductance changes with respect to that moving part. And that's what is going to create the force, not the magnitude of the inductance, but its derivative with respect to the moving part. So here's another design, important design consideration. Another interesting thing that we get from this, moving on, is I is squared, the current is squared, which means that the force only depends on the, uh, does not depend on the direction of the current we apply. Now, if the current is positive or negative, the force is always attracting the plate towards the core. If you revert the current, it doesn't matter. Sign here, negative square is a positive number. The force always goes in the same direction. Same goes for B square here. Right? As B is reversed, you know, if you go with a magnetic flux clockwise or counterclockwise, it doesn't matter. B is squared. Force is always in one direction. Right? So. Beyond just all this derivation, try to make sense of the equations and see what they tell you, what is the message behind them. That is very important. Are there any questions? I just have one question about um, on lecture, sorry, lecture 10, slide 13. When it says both sides of the air gap, does that just mean like, like one, like, like, from one side to the like on the in the core, like is that what that means? Uh, like, what does it mean by both the, sides? Yeah. I mean yeah. this in this. Right. Uh, I mean the one side of the air gap is this side, the other side of the air gap is that one. The force between the, the plate and the, the core is the force between both sides of the air gap, is the force that attracts one plate to another. Yeah, this is a kind of a weird uh, a weird statement. So the force between the plate and the core. Okay, so like the total force between the plate and the core, I guess. Yes, yeah. the, From the force any that curve, the plate yeah. is subjected to. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense, thanks. All right, I, I, uh, I think, yeah, this is not very clear, but um, also I want to point out that in this case, the area is 2A, is not just A as it is in the first case, okay? One last thing that we can define here is the uh, what we call the magnetic pressure. Uh, it's simply divide or simply divide the force by A. So you have B squared over two mu. That is what we call the magnetic pressure. So Newton per uh, meter is squared. When you multiply that by the area squared, then you get the, the, the effective force. Okay, just another definition. Nothing too important there. Okay. I have a question. Yes, go ahead. Uh, in the previous slide that you were just on, uh, in that, yeah, so in the first image that you have there uh, on the left, so one thing you mentioned was when the inductance changes, it's the inductance changes based off the change in um, uh, the air gap, right? Yeah. And the force changes based off the change in inductance. So like, if there's no change in inductance, then, then there is no magnetic force that you said, right? Yes. 
Yeah, so in the left image, how can you change the the air gap there if it's like a fixed like unit, if it's like one fixing it, like, unless no, I'm like can't. visualizing it wrong? You cannot, you cannot change it. Uh, but the inductance depends on X, the greater X, right, the, is, the, the uh, is smaller the inductance. If what I wanted to say is that if the whole thing is made of the same material, then the inductance now in your design does not depend on X. Right? Because it doesn't matter how far the plate and the core are, it doesn't matter how, how wide that gap is, the inductance is independent of X. In this case, even though X is fixed, it doesn't move, there is a force between both sides of, of X there. All right? And that is because the larger or smaller X, the inductance now depends on that value and therefore there is a force developed in them between them does that does that, does that help i i think so because the, the, maybe i just got it wrong because i thought you said that when there's a change in uh the air gap then then there's a change in inductance which which the, which with uh, the change in inductance creates the force Unless, yes well uh, uh, that is i think clearly visible on the right, right yes yes it's clearly visible now let's put the for the, the left one let's say this way the inductance must depend on X. Uh, if sorry, if, if you're drawing, I can't see if you're drawing something. If, no, I'm just cleaning the whiteboard. Uh, oh, okay. If the inductance depends on X, then there must be a force between both sides of that plate. If the inductance is independent of X, then there is no force. Even though X doesn't change, uh, the inductance depends on X. Oh, okay, 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 I see. All right, but for, you know, this, uh, this actuator on the, the left uh, is useless, right? It's a, it, there's, there's nothing moving there, but there is a force. So for uh, moving on, we are going to use the configuration on the right, right, because that's what is going to create motion and mechanical power. Okay, thank you. Okay, yeah. Any other questions? No, very well. If there are no further questions, let's do a few exercises. Let's start with this one. We have this electromagnet uh, or this magnetic circuit, I, I should say. It has a coil with 500 turns. The length of the air gap is 10 millimeters. A current of two amps runs in the coil. Calculate the attraction force between both sides of the air gap. Uh, and the energy is stored in the air gap. Neglect the reluctance of the core and the leakage flux. All right, this is another example here. Depending on how we define LG, right, if, if LG decrease, is decreased somehow, force increases. Right, force increases because the magnetic flux density B increases for a given current. Right? So it, the way you calculate the, the reluctance and therefore the inductance depend on how wide LG is. So there must be an attraction force between both sides of that actuator. Right? If this beam was, let's say, flexible somewhere, when we turn it on, they would move towards each other. Right? And when we turn it off, it would come back to its original position. So. LG has an effect on the inductance. Therefore, there is a force between both sides of that air gap. Okay, so let's calculate this. Let's start with the attraction force between both sides of the air gap. What do we need to calculate the attraction force? We are neglecting the core. And what do we need to calculate the attraction force here? How do you calculate the attraction force? We need B squared, we have the formula as one half of B squared divided by mu times A. So we first need to determine B, the magnetic flux density. How do you determine B? B is the uh, mu N I or L. B is mu, yeah, yeah. Or now let's go one step back. Let's use our favorite equation, integral of a closed path of HDL equals to ni, h is b 
over mu. What is L? Is this distance here. We are neglecting the entire core path. So L or G equals to Ni B equals to Ni mu over L. What is the force? The force between both sides of that air gap is B squared over two mu times A. We can now replace B in here. We have the force S in I mu over L squared times A divided by two mu. Already, we have everything. We have, if you simplify this, we can potentially simplify this. We have mu squared divided by mu, that is mu. So that becomes ni over L squared times A over two mu. Now we have everything here. What is A? What is A? What is the cross-sectional area? What is the cross-sectional area? 20 by 20. Uh, shouldn't it be 20 squared? It would be 20 millimeters squared, right? The cross-sectional area is this area here, right? Where the magnetic flux passes through perpendicular, right? So there would be 20 by 20 millimeters squared. So, N is, uh, how much was N? 500, 500. Current is two amps. What is L? L is this distance, right? That's 10 millimeters. So 10 times 10 to the power of negative three. Don't forget the units. All squared. A is 20 by 20 times 10 to the power of negative six divided by two times four pi times 10 to the power of negative seven. This is the permeability of the air gap because you're neglecting the, the, the core. So the force would be 200.51 Newtons. Uh, sorry, 2.51, not 200, 2.51 Newtons. Now, let me ask you this question. So this is a relatively simple, just applying the formulas, right? But we are making a relatively big assumption that uh, the, the core path here is negligible. What if it wasn't? How would you calculate that? How would you calculate all this? What would be the difference? What if the core reluctance was non-negligible? I, I gave you, let's say, the absolute permeability of this core, it was uh, 10,000. How would we, what would change here? Let's see. Would your B change? B changes, exactly. B changes because this integration now here would need to account for HDL for the core and HDL for the air gap, right? So we would have another term here. Would this equation change? Would the equation itself change? It would not, right? Because the, the inductance, even though the inductance depends on the core path, the absolute value of the inductance depends on the core path, its derivative with respect to the air gap does not. Right? Does not. So this equation still holds, but the value of B would indeed change. Okay. What is the energy stored in the air gap? What is the energy? That's question. So this is A 
what is the energy stored in the air gap? Is it just the force times the length of the air gap? Exactly, the force times the length of the air gap, right? This is B squared times two over mu A times L, this is the volume, right? So it's this times 10 millimeters. So it's the force, the energy is the force times LG. So it is 2.51 Newtons times 10 to the power uh, of negative three. Is this the same as WFG in the last lecture? Double FG, yes. WFG. Yes, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And this is 25.1 milli joules. Okay, any any questions here? Any questions? No? All good? All right. So, it's a clear that if the, the inductance, sorry, if the reluctance of the core path is non-negligible, the only thing that changes is the magnitude of B. The equation for the force does not change because this comes from the partial derivative of the inductance with respect to LG. And that is not affected by this part, right? The only thing that affects this is fixed. The only thing that would affect that is the air gap if you move that. Right. So the, equa the equation holds, but the value of B would have to be recalculated from here on by adding the reluctance of the core path. Very well. Oh, uh, question? Yes. Uh, is there a way to tell if the force is an attraction or a repulsion? It's always an attraction. Always an attraction. Yeah. As we saw in the, you know, if you, I, again, if you look at the equation, the equation tells that it's the force, it's a, the square of the current. So the current sign doesn't change, doesn't matter. It's always attracting the plate towards the core. And in this case, always attracting both sides of the air gap together, right? This example here, this is an electromagnet. So the, the, the load that a uh, bottom part is always attracted towards the core. You cannot make it move away unless we are dealing with a magnet. Right? If you replace that ferromagnetic path with a magnet, uh, ferromagnetic plate with a magnet, then yes, then we can control the direction because now we have magnetic fields that it can oppose or repel each other. But uh, with only a variable reluctance, there is no way to change the direction of the force. Thank you. No problem. Okay, so let's do one more. I'll let you read this one as I raise the light light board. Take a look and uh, think about solving this before we, we do it together. So we have an electromagnet with a square cross section, six by six centimeters, a coil with 300 turns and a resistance of six ohms. If the air gap is held at five millimeters, calculate the star field energy and the lifting force. The problem with a light board is that it takes a lot of energy to, to clean. Maybe I should make that a design project next year. Okay, so what do we do here? What would be the first step to determine the, let's say the field star energy and subsequently the lifting force? What do we need first? Just the current. We need the current, yes. Through the current, what can we find? Through the current, we can determine the flux, the magnetic flux density in the, in the gap. 
right? And through the magnetic flux density, we can now determine the attraction force. Okay, let me see if this is clean enough. Yeah. All right. So let's try this one. Let's do the stored energy uh, first and then calculate the, the force itself. Okay, so here we are. That's the, the ferromagnetic path. We can start by calculating the current. We have a 120 volts DC, uh, DC applied here. So now you can calculate the current. And what is the current through the coil? This is simply 20, 20 amps, right? The current is 120 divided by the resistance. Right, this is a DC, so the current is 120 divided by six. That is 20 amps. What, what else we need? Now we need to determine through the current, we need to determine the magnetic flux density B in the air gap. So we go again with our favorite equation, HDL equals to NI. What is HDL? Is B over mu times DL. What is DL now? If this is G, what is DL? Five. Five or 10? Oh, no, 10. For 10, 10, 10, right? So let's put our little sign here that indicates the closed loop integral uh, over a path. So we can choose this path here. And as we choose that path, we see that we pass through the air gap twice. So this is going to be two times G. And once again, you're neglecting the reluctance of the core. And this is equal to Ni. So if I solve for B here, we have Ni mu over 2G. N is 300. Current is 20 ohms, 20 amps, 4 pi times 10 to the power of negative 7. And we have 2 times five times 10 to the power of negative three. This is 0 0.754. What is the unit for B? Flux density? Tesla. Tesla. Very good. What is the field energy? Field energy is B squared that we have times divided by two mu, which we also have times the volume. B squared is 0 0.754 squared times two times four pi 10 to the power of negative seven. And what is the volume? What is the volume? Zero. Uh, sorry, I, could, I, couldn't, I couldn't hear you properly. That's times area? Yes, so that is six. So this is the area, again, again the cross-sectional area here. Uh, perpendicular to the flux. So that is six times six times 10 to the power of negative four. Right, that's centimeters. Okay, times the uh, height, which is five times 10 to the power of negative three. What is missing? Times. What is missing? Times two. All right, times two. This is 8.14 joules. We can now do the force. B squared over two mu times A, same story, 0 0.754 uh, over two times four pi 10 to the power of negative seven. And times the area, what is the area? Six times six times 10 to the power of negative four times two, times two, right? We have one area of attraction here. We have another area of attraction over there, hence times two. And this gives 0.7. 
a force of 1628 newtons. Could we also just divide WF by L? Exactly. If you divide this by five times 10 to the power of negative three, we get that. But just one L, right? Not two L? Just one L, yeah. Just okay. the distance between them, right? Not Why not two L? Because two L is only used here to find B. Right now we have the effective distance. The effective distance between two the two surfaces is is five, not ten. All right. So this divided by five millimeters gives the same result over there. Right. I just want to go this way to point out that here we have four times two. If we had a system with three, four areas, again, we would have to add one. If we had, let's say, another branch here in the middle, that area would also have to be accounted here. Okay. Sorry. Any, any, yes. Why, why did you multiply by two there? I didn't get that. I multiplied it by two because we have this area that is this, that there's a force here between this area and that part, but there is also this area here. The effective area being attracted by the magnet by, by the electromagnet is this area plus that area. Right? This area plus that area. So for calculating energy, is that already is that already accounted for when you did times two up there? To calculate the energy that is accounted for by times two. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So Thank to you. avoid to avoid this issues, uh you no know, with uh, which one to divide just to go with that. I think it's easier. Right? There's also this shortcut here divided by five, but it can lead to some complications or misunderstanding. So just go with that. There's no, no problem. Any, any further questions here? I have a question. Yes. I'm still a little confused because in the lecture, um, you kept mentioning that the force is caused by a change in the air gap, but none of these are changing. So what does this force actually mean? Is that like the initial force and then it can go up or down from there? This uh, as it is, this is snapshot of the current situation here. It, at five millimeters, this is the force. So this is like one instance in time. This is one instant in time. If we change okay. this, if we change this to four, this force will rise. Okay, I see. Why? Because B increases. So would we ever, because the reluctance decreases. Sorry. Would we ever get G as a function? Well, let's let's say that uh, your G is a function of time. Right. Your G is a function of time. Is a then uh, you can your force here will be a function of G. Uh, in this case, it's not a function of G because our G is constant. In the in this example, it's fixed. Right. It's fixed. This is still a force because the reluctance depends on the depends on G. If G changes, so does the reluctance and the inductance. Right. The force okay. the, depends on the, the change uh, that depends on G. Uh, if G is not constant, it becomes now a function of time. Then you need to go back to the derivation because this equation here uh, over there uh, was derived for fixed G. If G now changes over time, you need to rederive everything. And this is likely to be a function of G then a function of time, which is perfectly fine and easy to do. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay. Any, any other questions? No? All right, so if there are no further questions, let's go on to the next example. Let's, uh, this example 30, uh, 44. And example 44, we have here the same, the same system. But now the only difference is that instead of a DC voltage, we are applying an AC voltage. Mm -hmm. The AC voltage now has a magnitude of 120 volts, same magnitude that we had before. But now the, uh, it has a frequency of 60 Hertz. 
and everything else is the same. We want to calculate the lifting force in this case. What changes? What is the difference compared to the previous example? The current change. The current changes. Why does the current change? Because of the inductance. Precisely. Now the inductance of the coil needs to be accounted for. We actually, in fact, we model our entire solenoid as a perfect inductor. So if there is an inductor, and now I have an AC voltage, that AC voltage will create a additional impedance in the inductor and that in impedance will need to be accounted for. The inductance was, uh, was also there in the previous example, but in DC, the inductance offers no resistance to current changes. To current, sorry, to current. Now here we have an AC system and therefore we need to account for the inductance and its effect on the current. So let's do that. Okay, so now we have the same system, exactly the same system. We are changing voltage to AC. Now, because of that, here we have our equivalent circuit. Before we had this model as an ideal inductance, so there it is. We are adding the resistance of the coil. So this is the total impedance subjected to 120 volts and 60 Hertz. Our job now is to find L. And once we find L, we can determine the current through that. How do you define L? What is the, what is the inductance? The inductance is N squared divided by the reluctance of the core, or the reluctance of, of the entire circuit as seen by the magnetic flux. Because you are neglecting the core, then the inductance depends only on the air gap here and there. What is the reluctance? What is the reluctance here? 10 Two, over UA. Sorry, I... I 10 over that. UA over U not A. Yes, exactly. So 2 times G, 2 times G divided by mu A. 2 times G divided by mu A. What is A here? Is it six by six or is it six by six times two? Six by six. Six by six, right, six by six. That's the cross-sectional area, right? So that is six by six is not six by six times. Is that, is that clear? Yeah, don't, don't make that mistake. So this is, N is given 300, two times G, is five times 10 to the power of negative three divided by mu, that's the permeability of the air gap. So four pi 10 to the power of negative seven and A is six times six times 10 to the power of negative four. This gives the inductance as 40 milli Henry. Okay. Professor, I'm so just a little confused with the with the area here. It's the uh -huh. cross-sectional area of the winding, uh, that just that portion, right? Exactly, exactly. It's the cross-sectional area uh, that the magnetic flux goes through. So the magnetic flux is going, say like that, right? right? It's passing through this surface and it's the same here, everywhere in fact is the same, right? So it's just that cross-sectional area, this cross-sectional area right there. Now it's just A, not 2A. Now, if we calculate the force, we will have to account for 2A, but that's a different story, right? So that's the reason I'm insisting here is the force will depend on this A on that A, but the cross-sectional area from the reluctance perspective is just one. Right? If they were in parallel, it would be a different story, but they, they are in series here, so it's just one. Thank you. Okay. Question two? Yes, go ahead. So isn't the force also accounting for the field going through the cross-sectional area or no? The, sorry, I, I missed the first part of your question. I said, isn't the, the force also accounting for the, the field going through the cross-sectional area? Isn't it multiplied by two or no? Uh, 
Okay, so let's let's clear that up. So when you calculate the magnetic intensity, magnetic flux density B or, or B square for the purpose of force calculation, that it needs to account for the everything the magnetic field goes through, right? The magnetic flux goes through. So that will be this air gap and this air gap. The reluctance, when you calculate B, which is the reluctance that we have here, takes into account A, the cross-sectional area through which the magnetic flux goes through. That is A, 1A, right, A. If we, it doesn't make sense to add both. If we add both, we are saying that the magnetic flux has two times more area than it actually has to go through. That doesn't make sense, right? That's for B. Now, if you calculate F as uh, B squared over uh, mu, uh, sorry, mu, what is the equation again, times? Two mu a, yeah. This a is the entire area that is subjected to that force. If this area is subjected to a force, so is that one, right? Because it's all symmetric. So this would be two times a, two times six times six. Okay, but you see that this is one thing. Calculation of b is something else. It's a different principle. It's a different principle. This a. Refer, is, is not the same A as here. This A refers to the total surface subjected to the force. The A calculated here is not that, is it relates to the cross-sectional area through which the magnetic field passes perpendicularly. All right, so these are not the same concepts at all, even though we used the same uh, variables. All right, so this must be very clear and it's a good question to clear up right now. Okay, so we have the inductance, we have, we can all count, calculate, cal sorry, we, now we can calculate the impedance. What is the impedance? Is R plus the reactance of that, so it's six plus the reactance created by the inductor. What is it? It's two pi times L times the frequency which is 60 Hertz, right? This runs at a 60 Hertz times 60 J, right? This is a complex impedance. So Z is six plus 15.33 J ohms. All right, now we can calculate the current as 120 divided by the magnitude of Z. What is the magnitude of Z? Six squared plus uh, 15. 15.35 squared. The square root of that. And this gives a current as 7.3 amps. 7.3 amps. What was the current before it was 20 amps. Now it's 7.3 amps. I don't think we need to repeat everything. We know that a B equals to mu, a, uh, mu N I divided by two G, same equation that we used before. The only difference is that I has changed and F is B squared over two mu A, where A is this area plus that area, exactly as we did in the previous example. All right, so you have everything here. Nothing else has changed except that a B will change because I has changed, so we will so we will the force. So I'll just give you the final result here. If you input everything in these two equations and follow the same procedure, we should end up with 216 Newtons. 216 Newtons. What was the force before? The force in the previous example was 1600 newtons. And now we have 216 newtons. Right. Why, why that difference? Because now the impedance of the coil needs to be accounted for. We have an AC signal, right? It doesn't make sense at all to use an AC signal in this scenario here. If we plot the force, how would that look like over time? How would the force look like? 
to plot the current should look like this. Or how would the force look like? Something like that. It's 216. Right? The current is squared in this formulation for B. So the negative side cycle of the current also produces a positive force. The force between the plate and the core is always pointing up, in this case, always attracting one to another. And it will go from zero to the peak value there. So this is the peak force, right? The RM don't even, the average force will be something different, even lower than that. Okay. Questions? Questions, comments, concerns, no? All right. Okay, we have a few more minutes. If there are no really no questions here, I'm going to move on. Uh, just a very quick question. Go ahead. Um, in general, where where should we, if it's, if it's okay, if I'm gonna ask about the project, where should everyone be, would you say? Uh, at this point now, all the power electronics side of your project should be completed. Okay. I be, and uh, then the, the rest, uh, the second, the other parts will really depend on what you, you're working on. But I would expect uh, people that are working on, let's say anything related that has a motor control or uh, power electronic side to have that implemented and uh, simulated at least. And so it's a good question because I've noticed that uh, in the, uh, this week and last week, the traffic during office hours to discuss the design project has dropped. Uh, I still have a lot of spots available today if you would like to discuss it. So stop by. Don't leave it. Don't leave it for the last minute. We nobody wants a surprise. Uh, it's twenty percent of your grade, so it's the expectations are are high. All right, and if you have. Any questions should come to me and uh, Ben or Ben, and we uh, will be happy to help. Sounds right? good. And Thank if you. you don't, and if you if you're not sure, also the best thing to do is just to come to office hours. You can discuss it there. Okay, let's do one more example here. Let's do this one. Uh, the figure shows an electromagnet used to lift a section of steel channel. The coil has 600 turns and the reluctance of the magnetic material can be neglected up to a flux density of 1.4 Tesla. If the current in the coil is 15 amps, determine the maximum air gap for which 1.4 Tesla is developed, the force on the steel channel, and then C I'll leave for you to solve later because you're running out of time. All right, so for this one, we want to determine the maximum air gap for which the force, sorry, for which B is 1.4 Tesla. Tell me what to do. This is from lecture two. What is the maximum air gap for which we, uh, a maximum flux of 1.4 Tesla can be established? Well, we can the air gap. Yes, go ahead. Is this and this and that? Yeah. Yeah. I'm oh, sorry. I was just going to say you could start with the HDL equation. Exactly. Always start with our favorite equation integral of a closed path of HDL equals to NI. Now let's define this integration. Which path should we choose here for this closed path integral? Uh, the one that goes to the center of the coil. The one that goes to the center, exactly. So we can do this path, right? That path like that. Why not the outer path here? If you do the outer path, we can still do that, but what would be the result? Zero, zero, right? Because if you do the outer path, once again, like if you do it like that, then you have current coming in, going in, coming out, current going in, coming out. So the net current coming in and out here is zero. 
right? Whereas now you see that the current in the loop always goes in the same direction. So let's do that. So you have H is B over mu, mu zero, because you're only considering the air gap. What, what is DL? What is DL? Question, sir? Yes, go ahead. Uh, why not go through the, the air gap itself? What do you mean go through the air gap itself? So instead of like starting through the, the middle, like, uh, cause like the previous examples have just been considering the air gap and uh, tracing the magnetic core just through and around where the air gap is. I, I'm not sure if I understand the, uh, <coughs> the, the, the question. Uh, the reason I'm doing it this way, okay, I see, is that uh, the, the flux will go through the magnetic path because it has a lower reluctance, right? That we are neglecting, we are assuming that to be infinite. So it needs to pass through that path. The reason I'm specifying it here is to show that we have to go through one air gap, two air gaps. So this is times two G. That's where I wanted to get to. It's times two G because this distance is G, that distance is G. We are neglecting everything else. So we go exactly to the same formulation you had in the previous example. It's the same thing. I, I'm just I just wanted to show the path here to justify where this G is coming from, where that G is coming from. It's 2G, it's not G, it's not 3G, it's two times G, right? Because when you have to, we had to define this path in the other example, we had no other option, but to go through the air gap here, we can, we need to, to, to pick this closed loop integral. And by doing this closed loop integral, we end up with 2G, not three, not one, okay? But again, this part and this part, the core is being neglected as we did before. Okay, and this is equal to Ni. Sorry, I have a I have a quick question. Yes. Is one side more correct than the other side? Like we're going no. to the left, but it doesn't matter if we went to the right instead. No, it doesn't matter. It doesn't. It is. It doesn't matter. You can um, you can do either. Yeah. If you had uh, let's say different permeabilities or different uh, cross-sectional areas, then I would recommend going with a circuit of reluctances and then finding the total reluctance and the magnetic field th that way. In, in, I think we had an example like that in the early, in lecture two, right? You can take either side. As here is symmetric, so it's simple. If the, it's not symmetric or you have different permeabilities, then just do a network of, res of reluctances in series or in parallel as appropriate and then solve that way. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry, thank you. Okay, all right, so this is the air gap now by just simplifying this equation. And we have everything here and the 600 current is 15 amps. Permeability is four pi 10 to the negative seven because that's only the permeability of the air gap. And times two times B, we want to establish 1.4 Tesla. So times 1.4, which gives GS four millimeters. Four millimeters. Okay. All right. So that's that. Now let's calculate the last. So this is for A. Now let's calculate B. I'm what sorry, I have, a, I have a quick question. Please go ahead. Um, if we were not neglecting the reluctance in the core, would that yeah. HDL be H? HDL for the core plus HDL for the gap. Exactly. So you have this for the gap plus another term for the core. Where the only difference is the permeability, right? Yes. Okay. And, and, and in this, right? And the, and yeah, path, the core like, mean path. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. So we have B is still 1.4 Tesla. Now we want to calculate the force. The force is B squared over 2 mu times A. The force is 1.4 squared divided by two times four pi times 10 to the power of negative seven times the area. Uh, what is the area here? The area is this cross section. I, oh, sorry, the area needs to account for the depth. The depth here was, I think, uh, 800 millimeters. This is the information that is missing. Depth is 800 millimeters 
millimeters. This is missing from the question. I will add that to the annotated lecture notes. The depth into the light board is 800 millimeters. What is A? What is the area? Is it the area yeah. of all three? The area of all three, precisely. So the area here is subjected to a force. The area here is subjected to a force and so is the area there. So that would be 80 times 800 times two times 10 to the power of negative six plus plus this area, 160 times 800 times 10 to the power of negative six. Yeah. This area plus that area, here we are, plus this cross-sectional area, which has a width of 160 millimeters. The depth is the same, 800 millimeters. And that's the total area. Are we good? Now we can just replace it there. Calculate the force as 199 newtons. And then you'll let you solve question C. If you need help, come into office hours. I have office hours now starting at 10 until 11.30. And there are a few spots available uh, for drop-in if you have any questions. Okay, have a good day.